filmy McFilm film show. Yeah, Ang Lee's Hulk is probably one of the most universally hated films. It was hated on its release, it's still thought of really badly now, and it was so poor that they rebooted it just five years later with Edward Norton. And I have always been in a minority that I loved it when it first came out and I love it now. And I still think it's one of the most interesting superhero movies ever made. And I put it right up there with Batman Begins and The Dark Knight and all of the top tier, not just some of the best superhero movies, but some of the, the type of superhero movies where you can take them fairly seriously, or at least the director takes it seriously. And so we got Eric Banner, the beautiful, gorgeous Jennifer Connelly, and a great rest of the cast that uh, rounds it all out. Uh, Nick, uh, Nick Nolte playing Nick his, Nolte. his father. We start the movie, the first half an hour, admittedly, is a bit of a mess because they're trying to fit in a lot of story and a lot of background and a lot of context. And you can tell, it's the kind of thing where you can tell they filmed an awful lot of material and then cut it, found it in the editing room and cut out bits and pieces. And part of what makes the storyline, the storytelling, especially in this early segment of the film, a mess, is Ang Lee had, he wanted to recreate the kind of comic book slides in the visual storytelling of the movie. And this is another thing that generally people hate. Mm. I know you hate it. Mm. I know you're like chomping at the bit to get in it, but I, it, I, I just before you go off on it I get that at times it's overkill but I do appreciate um, that Ang Lee tried so hard to recreate that style of comic books in movie form and also I think at a point when he sticks to the more basic just split screen in comic book panel form um, I actually think it was pretty interesting storytelling technique like it was quite an interesting way of showing several different perspectives at the one time in the meantime Bruce you will be here Other times it was too gimmicky or just it just looked unappealing on, on the screen like at that point. So I admit he went overkill sometimes. It was really pissing me off, if I'm honest with you, like you don't have to do every fucking other transition as a comic book transition. It's like, yeah, we understand that you're you're paying homage to it, but like calm down a bit and <laughs> right, do you know what I mean? Like <laughs> Yeah, the main problems I had was when it became like these block mm. so that would twist and yeah. shake and that's when I was like that's not even comic booky that's just nothing but I, I go with it I have a real nostalgia for this movie I loved it when I saw it in the cinema when it first came out and I love it now I love it still um, but so we, we we basically get the context of the background that Eric Banner's dad was a genius in the field of bioengineering and he was working for the military to improve human DNA and something goes wrong or, or he, he basically, he starts, he, they refuse to give him human test subjects, so he starts testing on himself. And once he's tested on himself, he finds out that his wife is pregnant and the mm -hmm. son is born and he realizes that whatever he's done to his own genes and DNA has also passed on to his son. And he's very worried because even though he's, he's, he's changed the potential of their DNA, but it's still just potential. It hasn't tapped into whatever improvements in human evolution um, are possible. Something, some ingredient is missing. So, so the recipe's there, the setting is there for them to tap into some unknown human potential in both the father and son, but there's some sort of ingredient that's missing that will come later. So anyway, um, he starts to lose his shit when Ross, the general who's overseeing his work, realizes that he's been testing on humans, so he shuts down his soul experiments and he shuts down his access to the lab, and he loses it. He rigs the entire lab to explode. Personnel, fail safe has been initiated. Gamma decontamination will occur in 30 minutes. Evacuate immediately. I repeat, evacuate immediately. And he goes home and he wants to kill his son because he knows his son is the same thing that's in him. And he's actually worried about it. He, he's starting to regret what he's done. So we don't see what happens then because young Bruce Banner 
has repressed his memories mm. and he doesn't remember any of his early childhood and he grows up adopted by someone else without the name Banner thinking that his parents both died under mysterious circumstances and he's repressed those memories and he's also repressive of himself all the way through the movie whenever you see conflict come up he doesn't deal with it directly especially all early on <laughs> That means the the person it's like in in anger management that movie with jack nicholson and adam sander as dumb a movie as that is there's one great line in it where he's talking about the person with a temper that you need to worry about isn't the person who's shouting at the cashier because they um they overcharged him by two pound it's the cashier who's just standing there and taking it and taking it and can't can't ex- assert themselves and express themselves because those are the people that have rage building up yeah. inside them. And that's what this movie's all about. And part of the reason why people hated it so much is because they wanted an all-out action fest. And that's not what this movie is. This movie is Ang Lee does a Greek tragedy with Hulk as the main protagonist in exploring that. It's a it's a really introspective character study that happens to involve occasionally a giant green guy destroying army units and using tanks as a battering ram. Right, so what you just said, Declan, is one of my main gripes about this film. It's like, the film's called Hulk, and Hulk doesn't fucking turn up to 40 minutes into the film, and you're like, I came here to see the fucking Hulk, not Bruce Banner, do you know what I mean? <laughs> Well, I got news for you. I didn't come here to see you. I came here to see my son. My real son. But mm. I, I just think in general, right, I get what Ang Lee was trying to do, but I think to me this this movie just seems like forced. Do you know How do you mean forced? Like, it, it, it just tries too hard, man. All the comic book transitions, all the fucking... Bruce Banner origin stuff, it just seems a bit like forced upon. Like it's like if I went to fucking watch Iron Man and for two hours of the two and a half hour film it's all about Tony Stark. I'll be like, I wanna see fucking Iron Man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Do you know what and I, mean? I, I get that and Iron Man is beloved and I really like it as well. And it basically Iron Man and John Favreau set the tone for what at least Marvel comic book movies were gonna be for the next decade and a half. Did he direct that? Yep. And oh. uh but I just, for me, it Hulk reaches higher than, like, I really do feel like modern Marvel movies especially have just turned into big theme park rides, and they, they barely feel like real movies, and there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with your main goal in the movie just being as entertaining as superficially as possible. That's yeah. going to make a very enjoyable film, there's nothing wrong with that. But I, for me, those films are just not memorable. Hulk always really had a big impression on me. And I get that some people take take it as it was very dour and a bit too moody and too serious, but I was so drawn in to the character and the dynamic between them and the father and son relationship. And the a lot of this movie is actually about your relationship with your father and what that means and your relationship and trauma as a child, repressed trauma. Because uh, a, a huge part of the movie is also about the dynamic between Jennifer Connolly and her own father. Yeah. And him as a general, he's not a bad guy at all. He's just trying, he makes decisions based on how he sees fit. And he locks away Nick Naughty's character, Bruce Banner's father, for 30 years because he thinks that's the right thing to do. And it probably is the right thing to do because the guy's a lunatic. And when he's dealing with uh, his daughter in the movie, they have an estranged relationship at the start of the film because. He clearly has, at times, overreached into what she sees as controlling her life. You said I could trust you. I'm your father. You can trust me to do what I think is right, not what you think you want. He is a human being. Well, he is also something else. And you have all these di- all these different relationships. That's what resonated with me, I remember, 20 years later, of why I still love the Hulk movie. And it's kind of similar. I remember talking to someone about why the classic trilogy of Star Wars has so much more staying power 
and magic to it than everything that's come since. And it was because, you know, I remember when the we were young when the prequel trilogy came out, and all the chat was about uh, this is the most CGI shots ever in one movie, mm. and this special effect and that, and this, that, and the other. And I remember a person just saying like, I don't, I don't remember jack about special effects from the first trilogies. I just remember how great the characters <coughs> were, and that's what I felt about Hulk. Like, People say all they want is smashing, and maybe they do, because they kind of got that in the Edward Norton Hulk, and people seem to generally think that's the better movie. But for me, I find it so much more interesting where they went with the character, and how they how they, they spend... Like, it, it's funny, because all the things you don't like about it are kind of nearly the things I like about it. I like the fact that we spend 40 minutes not setting up just why Hulk comes to be because that get, that essentially doesn't get that much screen time. Which generally, we know as well from, from the comic books. Uh, Eric Banner, uh, Bruce Banner, Bruce Banner gets um, irradiated by gamma radiation, turns him into the Hulk. So we don't need forty minutes to set that up, but we need forty minutes to lay out his character, his relationship to his father, that, and the memories he's repressed, and how he interacts, and how unassertive he is, and how he he suppresses all this rage deep inside of him. And it's the character we we set up with all that. There's also another reason why I hate this. Yeah. <laughs> I, I totally get all your points, but I had an absolute shocker with this because yesterday I watched it and I couldn't fucking find it anywhere. I know that you stream it online, but I don't have like a bit of like a, like I can't stream it through my TV. It is interesting. Disney Plus seems to just pretend it doesn't exist. So, so basically, sure they have the rights. I went on Amazon and I rented it to like two quid. And I was like, oh, this is fucking so awful. And then I finished it and I realised that it was on Now TV and I could have got it for free. And I was fucking fuming. I was like, no. It's not really I was, oh, no, I know. But um, going back to your original points, um, but I guess I guess what Ang Lee was trying to do was give, not, we all know about the Hulk, but do we know about Bruce Banner? So I guess he was trying to give him as in Bruce Banner, the origin story, which is what he was trying to do, I guess. I mean, the identity, I don't mean like the secret identity, I mean like the character identity of any superhero character is so interwoven into mm. their origin story. Mm. And ha ha one of the things about superhero characters that make them potentially such interesting characters is that the fact that they are essentially, other than Superman, who is born a superhero and then he later becomes assumes the identity of a human yeah which is explained in that brilliant speech by um david carradine and kill bill 2. Uh, yeah. other than that all superheroes are essentially reborn at some point in some sort of circumstances usually like a radiation thing or some sort mm. of magic happens but it's always mirrored at some sort of personal thing happening in their life you know uh, batman is the product of having awful trauma of seeing his parents murdered at a young age. Um, the Hulk is uh, a product of seeing this awful trauma that he represses and then he has all these repressed memories and this repressed rage and it starts coming out and that's mirrored in the fact that this anger and rage comes out in the form of Hulk that only comes mm. out from certain points but even he's not conscious when he's Hulk it's like these are these blind spots that are coming out yeah. so it's superheroes are always like that it's always like you can't have a superhero about an origin story and superhero movies that skip over the origin stories to me it's you've, you've missed the most interesting thing about the character nothing that happens to a superhero is ever going to be more interesting and integral to what it is than the origin story can i ask who is your favorite superhero um, I th i'm thinking it could be the hulk <laughs> by um, i mean i kind of part of why i love this as well is I don't really consider the Hulk a superhero, and I don't really consider it a superhero movie. Like, when you draw comparisons between the Hulk and any other superhero, it's basically, he's not like any other superhero. He's not really a superhero. He doesn't do, really yeah. do much too consciously when he is the Hulk. The Hulk is nearly an alter ego, and a different personality than him. Like Jackal and Hyde. It is essentially like, Jackal Yeah, Jackal and Hyde. It's quite funny because I watched... See, I get really confused, Declan, about the whole... Marvel verse, whatever whatever the mm. fanboys call it, because I, I I never know like what film is after the other or what's going on. I can't keep track of it. So I watched the Hulk with Edward Norton just to compare mm. them, and um, this is a thought I had about Hulk 
and they kind of address it in this movie. It's like, why does a Bruce Banner, if he knows he gets angry, utilise techniques that stop himself getting angry? And like Edward Norton's Bruce Banner like does meditating, he has a heart monitor to like show when he's getting angry and stuff. It's like, if you know you're getting angry, like why don't you like, you know, just calm down? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Come on, Bruce, aren't you feeling a little angry? After all, you've only got me to play with now that Betty's dumped you and gone back to Berkeley. <laughs> You're lying. Come on, Bruce. Let's see what you got. There. You know, consciously you may control it. But subconsciously, I bet that's another story. Well, that's true, but also, you gotta remember, this version of Hulk is... If the actual movie spans over probably, I think it's about a week, other than the flash forward at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe less than a week. Yeah. So, I mean, he is he only transforms into the Hulk three times. Yeah, you're right. In this movie. You're right, yeah. Um, one of the things I love as well is the fact that he he gets so big in this movie as the Hulk. Like he becomes it's huge. Like yeah. one one thing we talk about like it's not enough action and stuff, and fair enough, but one thing they absolutely pushed to the max was his strength levels like yeah the Hulk that's one of the things I loved as well is that this movie it felt like like we were saying a Greek tragedy it felt like you were dealing with gods rather than superheroes and supervillains that was the scale it kind of set and when you see Hulk yeah. um, jumping across entire deserts no, that in is, a single leap that that is sick that's one of the things I like about Hulk he can't fly or anything his way of getting around is just like leaping <laughs> and the the way Ang Lee directs a lot of the action sequences some are more conventional some are you know like when he's when he's attacking the tanks and he picks up one tank and swings it into another one and and all that um, but some of them they're just so beautifully shot like when he at one point he a cluster bomb lands and mm. jumps away from it and there's a high up bird's eye view of him flying through the air jumping away from as all these different explosions lit at the ground beneath him and it's just it's nearly like ballet the way he's directing these moments and I get the way if you're just wanting all that action um, but I, th I think one of the things I really appreciate about this movie as well it's one of those it will never happen again type movies because it's so rare to get a giant super big budget superhero movie about a giant green guy smashing things that is essentially like nearly like an art house movie the golden question who would win in a fight, Hulk or King Kong? Which King Kong are we talking about? Peter Jackson's King Kong. Who okay, let's take down T Rexes. Let's, by the way. let's <laughs> run through all the um, King Kongs actually. So we'll start with Peter Jackson's King Kong. Okay, so I think the Hulk would just immediately uh, destroy. Him. Destroy. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. He would. He would punch King Kong once, and immediately its giant rib cages would be rupturing its internal organs. <laughs> 1970s King Kong who was okay. who was about if I remember correctly I think he was like a third of a, a third as tall as the World Trade Center okay um, I think would put up a much better fight but I, I think Hulk would probably still kill him okay maybe I've asked the wrong question okay. Hulk or Superman um, depends how I think if you're talking about just strength Hulk, if you're talking about an out and out fight, I don't know. I mean, I think Superman. Would Superman be. would probably yeah. win. I don't know. See, I'm not a superhero comic book nerd, so I don't really know like the actual because physics and stuff. Superman can shoot lasers from his eyes. To be honest, true. Um, but going back to my question, try and guess what my favourite superhero is. Uh, Wonder Woman. Gal Gadot is fit, but not not okay. not, not her. Okay. Um, Catwoman. It's a man. Okay. <laughs> uh, Robin. Nope. Well, I am the, I am the shit side kick half, <laughs> half of the time. Who? Your name is not Krenzler. It's Banner. What? Your name. It's Banner. Bruce Banner. Bruce, how'd you get in here? So meanwhile, while Bruce has um, been living his whole life, not realizing who he is, his dad has spent 30 years in an insane asylum, but he's finally been released. 
and he seeked out Bruce, seeked out his son, and he starts working as the janitor in the very lab that Bruce is working in. And when Bruce Banner is recovering from being irradiated by the gamma rays in the accident, in the bed, at night, his dad comes to him, and he's kind of shocked and like freaked out, and his dad starts talking to him, telling him who he really is, and everything that's happened, and this, that, and the other. And between this and all the mountain tensions that have been building up recently, he finally explodes and his rage gets him and he has his first transformation into the Hulk. What did you think of this first uh, set piece as the Hulk? The CGI is fucking shit. <laughs> right, um, and what I don't understand about Hulk or Bruce Banner, whatever trousers he's wearing, they're always purple, even though he's wearing jeans. <laughs> <laughs> no, but to be fair... <laughs> If they didn't do that, if yeah. he's if it wasn't always the, the standard, like in the comic books, it was always purple trousers. Yeah. You'd be going, why is this trousers? Yeah, that's purple? true. Yeah, that's true. This is not faithful to the fucking source material. No, um, I guess this film is two thousand and three. So if we think about it now, it's nearly twenty years old, really. So it's funny you say that because I was I was thinking when I watched it this time around that the CGI is really really still. I felt it really holds up still, considering it was back in 2003. And especially considering, I actually feel like the standard of CGI has plateaued for years. And I feel like part of that is because so much CGI is is done now. It's farmed out to like all parts of the world and India and stuff where different places where um, people can do CGI for cheaper. And I nearly feel like movies like Marvel and Hollywood in general have trained us to accept a certain standard of CGI without really expecting it to get better. Like if you look at the recent Hulk in Endgame, are you going to mm. tell me that's 20 years better than the Hulk in Ang Lee? Smooth. Okay, my question is, what would you rate as good CGI then? Well, what, would, we, would we, you... Well, we, no, answer we, my question first. I think it is better than that one. No, no, but is it... It might it's be... Not, it's I'm not sh- I'm sure if you put them next to each other, there's slight... Slight differences where you say that's okay, better. yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it twenty years better? No, I don't. It's not. Yeah, no, I don't. Yeah, I agree with that. But the gold standard for fucking CGI was meant to be Avatar. You know what I mean? But I didn't rate that film, so I'm, I wasn't sure about that. I um, hate Avatar as a movie. But I mean, I like Pixar films as CGI. Like, well, that's I mean, that's animation. But the well, um, true, yeah. Avatar was pretty fucking good. And one thing I will say, whatever you feel about the character, the 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 creature design or whatever and, and the, or how good the CGI actually was um, David Cameron 100% like he always does in everything he does with movies was trying to push the envelope on how good it could be my yeah. point is I feel like movies and the industry has kind of decided that audiences will accept a certain level of CGI because it's not it's not necessarily not everything is to do with how far on it's moved like if you look at Peter Jackson part of the reason why the special effects was so good in the Lord of the Rings say or King Kong it wasn't just the mm. fact that the budgets were huge the budgets were huge but there would be similar sized budgets of movies that would have come around at, at that same period that would have had rubbish special effects in comparison a lot of it also is firstly how how well a person knows special effects to apply it like Peter Jackson is a special yeah, effects guy yeah. for, first and foremost he's a special <laughs> effects guy yeah. he knows how to shoot and design the entire movie from the ground up to work with the special effects to get the absolute most out of it. And and uh, also, the time it takes to actually work on the special effects. A lot of, like for the T-Rex battle in King Kong, a lot of those shots and CGI shots were being worked on before uh, pre-production was even done. Let alone yeah. shooting began. So, and before release, so that means sometimes they've been working on straight for three years. Whereas now, there's more of a, it's more of the norm to really have to, you know, CGI people have, CGI teams and workshops have a huge amount of jobs on their schedules and they have to get, get through things quicker so that you can't just have the same level of love and care and work going into CGI nowadays. I think Ridley Scott was the best from Blade Runner. Like reading the making of Blade Runner, like the flying cars and stuff, the amount yeah. they put into it. Well, exactly. Like that's someone, as someone who understood yeah. it, yeah, and yeah. therefore the results he, on screen he, yeah. are incredible. He he basically fronted it. He was like he hired every single person from the special effects department itself because he loves 
CGI special effects so much. And like some of it, they were like, this is the best we can do. He's like, no, scrap it. <laughs> and that's why they ended up falling out of him yeah. <laughs> on the whole set. But yeah, yeah. So I mean, we'll, we'll rush ahead to the next Hulk transformation now. Yeah. And I'll let you rant on about the mutant dogs. <laughs> Well, basically, Hulk's dad comes in to the to the hospital bed or wherever he's in. He's got a plethora of dogs in there sleeping. It's like, why are these dogs here? It's like, what's going on? And then we find out what's going on. Basically, Hulk, he transforms and like runs away. Does he run away to Jennifer Connelly's house, basically? He runs away because he gets a call from his father that he sent these mutant dogs yeah. after Jennifer Connelly. Yeah, so he goes there. And then all of a sudden, a giant poodle fucking starts attacking her, basically. And then Hulk starts fighting all of them. It's a good. Uh, well, what did you What do you hate about it? You said that. In the I just think it was, I just think it was. I just think it was stupid. Like, what's the point of this? Like, honestly, like, why are you gonna for some reason make dogs into like Hulk? So, <laughs> I mean, what, why not? Dog? First of all, that's fucking cool. That's good. Secondly, point, I yeah. always loved this. Like, I I always loved it partly because it was such an unexpected thing that I just didn't expect to see in the movie of Hulk fighting three giant mutant dogs um, mm, and I just yeah. always enjoyed the sequence I enjoyed the sequence how it built up to it where he, he transformed when Glenn the annoying evil corporate guy comes around yeah. and starts bullying um, Bruce Banner again and like we've seen before where usually where he'd come in Bruce would be very passive because he's a passive person because everything about his character up to this point has been about repressing his emotions and repressing his memories but now that the Hulk is on the scene that doesn't happen anymore so he lets his anger out and the Hulk emerges and he jumps off and this is the biggest Hulk we've seen so far as well he's like, he's like twice the size of the first Hulk we see and he goes off and Jennifer Connelly actually just discovers him in the woods because he's waiting nearby and that's when the dogs show up but I love the whole sequence as well because it plays out is I don't know if it's because it's so well directed by Ang Lee or I just have a bias for this movie or what I actually think it's most likely is that Jennifer Connelly such a good actress that she sells that moment for me as, as absurd as it is that a woman would see a giant mutated version of her former lover and then he beats up three mutant dogs and she would not be running away scared but actually be drawn to him and want to look after him yeah. Um, that is just so absurd, but the whole sequence sells that for me, and I believe it. And I think it's mainly down pinned on how good of an actress Jennifer Connelly is. Sounds like a great Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> Beat up some mutant dogs, Jennifer Connelly's there. <laughs> but yeah, no, the, the sequence was. Actually, to be fair, but if we look at it, the sequence was quite cool, but I just thought, why are the mutant dogs, man? No, no, no look, I, I will never argue with you just with us when you just inherently don't like something in a movie yeah, like yeah you can't really argue with that but so this builds up to the next sequence because jennifer connelly calls her dad because she's like i don't know what to do my boyfriend's standing for the giant green monster and so they take him away to some secret facility and at this point ross jennifer connelly's dad the general has been basically superseded by glenn the little prick corporate guy mm. and he's now in charge of the operation and he's just obsessed with he wants to get the dna or the blood or whatever from the Hulk because he wants to take it and turn it into a weapon and sell yeah. it to the army and whatever. So it builds up to my favourite sort of period of the whole movie. From this point onwards, I just love this part of the movie where where everything from him uh, having the nightmare during um, when he's in that chamber yeah, as uh, Glenn is trying to induce him to turn into the Hulk up until him escaping the facility and going on that voyage through the desert towards San Francisco and fighting all the army helicopters and the jets and everything. Everything is just amazing. And even up until the sequence when he's in San Francisco and one of the jets takes him up all the way to the top of the atmosphere where he passes out. Yeah, yeah. Takes him all the way up to, into space. And it's moments like that where it's just so interesting. And again, the fact that as he's falling back to Earth unconscious, we again go into a, a dream sequence where you see Eric Banner wrestling with this alter ego he has, wrestling with his own suppressed emotions, 
And that just kind of sums up the way Ang Lee approached the movie, where it is about the character. And I get most people hate that, but I love it. For me, it just works and it's so interesting. And I find it, if this movie had just been a, a smash and blow it up, smash through the city, fight a big bad guy, half every scene in the movie kind of film, it just wouldn't be memorable to me. It wouldn't have the stay in power that it did have for me, but it's because of moments like that and the way everything, the action is always secondary to the character introspection and the, the story. And that's why everyone hates it, but that's why I love this movie. Yeah, that, that again, that was a pretty cool sequence. I can't deny that. <laughs> but again, it just seems to try too hard to me. I was like, oh. So when you say try too hard, what do you mean? <laughs> no, I, I think, I think, this this film sets up a lot of set pieces that are good, but the the, the the stuff superseding it is not worthy of the set pieces. So like, right, I, yeah. I, I was like, oh, so there's a fight now. <laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean? Like, so do you feel like by the time you got to the action pieces anyway? Yeah, I was just I I, I just checked out. You like, checked, so, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, so we get to the final sequence. So Nick Nolte's character has handed himself in. And before that, he's he's realised, like I said at the beginning, this missing ingredient to tap into his work 30 years before of enhancing and tapping into the potential of human DNA. The missing ingredient was these gamma radiations that his son accidentally found out about 30 years later. So he goes and puts himself under the gamma rays. And resulting from that, he doesn't have a hawk like quality he has the ability to bond with any matter in the universe and i was trying to work out i assume clearly the fact that the gamma radiation what it brought out of physically out of bruce banner was a mirror of his subconscious oh, so you're thinking that so what the same thing yeah but in what way because i assume it would be but is there any way? Is I don't there think there's about... any correlation between? No, fair enough. Yeah, I don't think there was for the dad, but I was trying to work yeah. out. I was just interested if you had any ideas. Or... It was as if she and the knife merged. So he hands himself in, and he says all he wants is to have one last, see his son one last time, and then he'll hand himself in, whatever. So, we are set up for the final big sequence, and in a secluded area, Bruce Banner and his dad are hooked up to electrodes so that they can be fried at any second if anyone tries anything, and they're having their last showdown with each other. It's, it, it kind of, this is a bit where I feel like Nick Naughty kind of takes over the movie for me, because he's been, he's been quite restrained in everything he's done up till this point. But at this point, he's just a complete egomaniac. And the relationship he has with his son up to this point kind of reaches its climax. Yeah. Because his whole thing from the start, you could see he's, he was obviously a genius. He was obviously a brilliant man. But he's also, he, he was more interested. He wanted to do human studies when he, even when everyone else knew it wasn't safe. He's more interested in his own legacy, his own work, his ego, than any anyone else, and including his own son. Like he tried to kill yeah, Bruce, yeah, yeah. as we find out that the repressed memory that Bruce had all those years ago was that when his father came back and tried to kill him, he accidentally killed, killed his own his mother, mother yeah. in front of him. And he, the only reasons he's come is because he wants Bruce to turn in to the Incredible Hulk and then to sap all his energy, take it over his yeah. his matter. So we get to the last big fight sequence. Nick Nolte bites into the electrical wires. He turns into a giant electrical man, grabs the Hulk. They go up to the sky. Again, this, like part of the reason why I love this movie so much is, is, is how interesting and unique a lot of the action moments are. And some people say it's boring and I'm fair enough, but I love 
this moment where you see these, where you see their battle etched in the sky. <laughs> was cool that was but, uh, but overall Declan the worst end fight se sequence I've seen in a long while really he turns into a rock Hulk grabs him pushes him into the water they start fighting underwater for a bit Hulk can just breathe underwater seemingly and um they give me your power transfers all the power to him the power is too much they send the bomb and kill him see that <laughs> <funny, laughs> again it's, it's because Ang Lee was still more interested in the character. Even when you see um, them going through the cloud, if you actually look at, if you if you pick them out as frames or panels in the comic book, if you pick them out as frames of every time there's a image stuck in time, it's Hulk being nearly like a child where he's bearing over him, and then slowly by the end he starts getting the upper hand. Yeah. So for me, Hulk is. Is, is one of the few films that generally is hated that I love. I really think it's misunderstood. I would love it if... I remember thinking at the time when I first really liked it and everyone seemed to hate it. I assumed it would... It would grow on people. Like, with time, people would come to appreciate it as a really good movie. I get how expecting one thing and getting something very different can really make you dislike something. But... Then... Going, coming back to it at a later date, knowing that it's not what you first expected it to be, often can, you can look at the movie different. You can appreciate it for what it actually is rather than what you thought it was going to be. It doesn't seem to be the case for Hulk. People seem to just straight up hate it, like my co-host. Yeah, did. yeah. Do you want to give your final well, thoughts? Well, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, I thought, it's a rip, number one, it's a really long film. It's like nearly three hours, two hours, 18 minutes. The Hulk doesn't turn up to 40 minutes into it. I get what Ang Lee was trying to do, but it, it's just too much of a mishmash and it's too messy for me. Like, So I, I'm i sorry that I don't rate this film. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Basically, if you take all the reasons Phil said he doesn't like it and flip it, that's more or less all the reasons I do like it. And admittedly, this is a very flawed film. At points, the, the visual storytelling and the way he tries to incorporate uh, comic book panels and, and those sort of it becomes gimmicky and kind of annoying at times. Uh, some of the acting at times is quite ropey. If, if you worry too much about the logic of the plot, sometimes there's quite glaring plot holes. But if you don't concentrate on any of that and you focus for me on what the movie is worried about, it's not worried about those things. It's worried about the character. It's worried about exploring that and exploring the relationships between all the characters. And at most, the character of Bruce Banner and his alter ego, the Hulk. And if you enjoy that sort of thing, if you enjoy films that focus on those sort of things, secondary to the action, and a lot of time the action is only as a, as a way of exploring those themes and those ideas and those sort of things, then you'll get a lot out of this movie. And even just as, as an oddity, you can get a lot out of this movie. Like, it's a very unique movie. It's very rare that a film with this budget about a superhero, had, I mean, nowadays it's more common, but back then especially, it was very unusual for a director to get to take this approach with this sort of movie. Or for any blockbuster, it's very rare you get a, a intelligent blockbuster that's more interested in really trying to create a great film and a great character study and exploring themes of, this, of a thing rather than just purely trying to get bums on seats and sell tickets. So I really hope people give Hulk a second chance. I hope it eventually gets seen as what I think is one of the most interesting superhero movies ever made and a film that really stayed with me from ever since I was a child when I watched it when I was about 11 years old. Everything from the amazing performances by Eric Bana and Jennifer Connelly especially to the incredible visuals of Hulk jumping across entire deserts with a single bound um, and to the amazing musical score which I think even people that hate the movie can admit that the main thing is absolutely beautiful so it's an easy recommendation for hulk and that goes of course for phil as well <laughs> no <laughs> okay so it's half a recommendation yeah half, half, a recommendation. half, half. give it a, give it a watch if you want to <laughs> <laughs> Shit.
Should I neutralize? No! I can't do anything with Goof. Come on! Filming McFilm Film Show.